of the SCORES Poetry Summit, Words in Action. My name is Angela Bailey. I'm coming to you from America Scores Bay Area, where we work with over 60 different school sites in the Bay Area in order to provide free soccer, poetry, and service learning programming for youth. Across the country, we're in 11 different cities working to provide programs for over 12,000 young poet athletes. And we call them poet athletes because they are learning life lessons and learning how to express themselves on the field, off the field, wherever the need may be. This week has been incredibly powerful, super lineup of speakers, activists, poets, writers, change makers. And I would be remiss if I did not thank the folks who helped us to put this on. So to so the organizing committee, Alicia Yano, Tamson Smith, Dean Rader, and Colin Schmidt, awesome job on bringing this community together. And of course, to our corporate partners, the SAC brand group, and also Soma Equity. Without your support, we couldn't have done it. So thank you for contributing to the cause. This session, I think, is the way that we should end our week, that we should go into our weekend because it is going to be so powerful. We have Writing for Justice with Youth versus Apocalypse. Anaya Butler, 15 years old, lead circle member, writer started at eight years old, is gonna go ahead and moderate the session. Anaya, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to everybody for showing up. We are going to record all these sessions we have, so you can see them later if you're not on it now. Thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you, Anaya, for bringing this panel of this session together. That's all you. Yes, thank you for that introduction. So just to open us up, I'll be playing YVA's music video, This Is The Time. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. Louder, so I'ma keep on fighting till you see my power. Not gonna break down, but build a better tower. Cause I'm a bright flame and never less than ember. And I'ma keep on to a last endeavor. And we can save lives, be allies, save our planet together. Get up and fight, it's time to make the world right. This a long time coming, we've been fighting since the genocide of the native people. Then they stole my key folk off the mother soil. Look outside, you know this the time. If we don't fight now, then we won't survive. Act for your ancestors, I'm acting for mine. If it wasn't for their might, this wouldn't be the time. Get up and go, get up and vote. We only out of time when we lose hope. It's time to fight, we have the power. When they try to silence us, we just speak louder. I'm the one who gets targeted by racism, sexism, violence. But most of all, white silence from the lowlands to the highlands. Come on, y'all, we can do better than that. Let it be known, it's in your bones. Use your vote for a good razón. El poder está en las palmas de tus manos. Es bien claro, hay que aprender a usarlo a votar. Ahí nos vamos. Get up and go, get up and go. No matter how you do it, but you voting for the earth. Voting for the people who ain't got a chance to vote. Deprived for the matter, cause it's scared about my vote. You talk about collective liberation and show the support. Been had the conversations like you're ready to implore. To say the world, we can't do it alone. So pick your butt up and pull up to the polls. Get up and go. Get up and vote. Votar es importante. Había mucha gente que no lo podía hacer antes. Las mujeres y la gente de color salieron a la calle, protestaron con valor. Mucha gente marcharon, mucha gente peleó por el derecho de votar. Mucha gente murió, so dime tú cómo se sentirían si su esfuerzo fue en vano. Ellos lucharon, pero el derecho no lo utilizamos. Hay que votar, tenemos que sacar al presidente actual de la Casa Blanca. Tu voz tiene que abusar, no te puedes callar. Recuerda a tu vecino, juntos lo vamos a lograr. We 
You watch them spend billions of dollars on weapons and call it protection. Fossil fuels, chopping trees, these are the weapons. Oceans rising like my anxiety, increasing heat, increasing my thoughts, I cannot think. I am impatient. I want to live in a nation where my leaders actually lead. They see our lungs are being filled with the last breath from burning trees. Drowning in ashes, more flames and people. Soon the ratio between living things and air will be unequal. Is this the world you want us to live in? You say I'm so inspirational, sit in a seat of power, and still create no change. I don't just want to be inspirational. I want you to do what we demand. Um, I hope y'all enjoyed that. Um, a couple of YVA people, including myself, helped co-produce that music video. Uh, it was a really cool experience to do and also perform and write. Like, um, yeah. So now we can start getting into um, the panel. Before we get into that, I just want to give a quick introduction to myself, um, to Youth vs. Apocalypse and the Hip Hop and Climate Justice Initiative. Um, so basically, my name is Anai Butler. I'm 15 years old. I'm from Oakland, California. I'm an activist and spoken word poet. I've been writing since around eight years old and I've been performing since I was 10. Um, I'm also a Lead Circle member with Youth vs. Apocalypse. YVA is a Bay Area based group led by predominantly frontline youth fighting for climate justice. Um, within YVA, I'm the coordinator of the Hip Hop and Climate Justice Initiative, which started about last year. We recently released an EP with three songs, two music videos, and three spoken word pieces. In the Hip Hop and Climate Justice Initiative, we basically pressure our power holders to take the immediate climate action we need while also mobilizing youth activists to use their forms of art with hip hop as a form of activism. But um, yeah, so I really wanted to create a panel where I wanted to emphasize, you know, the role that writing has had and really any justice movement we've seen and how writing can be such a powerful tool and method of activism. Um, so with that being said, I first wanted to open up um, this panel with a performance. Unfortunately, one of our panelists, Lambila Abbas, could not make it today, but she requested that I read her poem, Still Like a Wind, which I'll be doing. Um, so this is not my piece, so I'll read it to the best of my abilities. But um, yeah, thank you all again for being here. This poem is titled Still Like a Wind. You may break me down every day with your stinging words, crabby lies, and twisted norms. And still, like a wind, I will rise again. I seek freedom to live more. Does my brazenness upset you? For what reason would you say you're assailed with despair? because I walk like a queen of crown, believing on my own dreams, and still like a wind, I will rise again. I seek right to dream more, just like the moon and stars with the certainty of tides, just like beam of hope shining high walking on my feet, and still like a wind, I will rise again. I seek pleasure to accomplish more, leaving behind every fear and doubts with the clear vision to go, I will rise like a wind again and seek to empower justice more. Um, yeah, so that's a beautiful poem by Nabila Abbas. Like I said before, she could not be here, but I am so happy that she let me read her poem because I still want her presence and energy to be here. Um, so I hope that poem was a good you know, opening for you guys. But now I wanna get into the panel. Um, we have amazing panelists today, which I'm so excited to hear from. Um, so before we get into the questions, I just want to allow all the panelists some time to introduce themselves, um, their name, where they're from, and a kind of a background of their art and their activism. Um, feel free to jump in. Hey, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here. My name is Mush. Um, I represent San Francisco, California and Oakland, California and also Hercules, California. Uh, these are all the different cities that uh, raised me. I'm a daughter of immigrant children. And so I was raised by my uncle, my grandparents, my cousin's dog walker, everybody. Um, I wanna just say thank you to Anya specifically for inviting me in. I'm a poet, I'm a mother. Uh, I sit on the Cultural Affairs Commission for the city of Oakland. So basically that's just a fancy way of saying anybody that you know calls himself an artist in our city, my duty is to listen to their voices and to their needs and do to the best of my ability advocate for the city, the mayor, city council member, to put those resources uh, into the hands of our artists, particularly uh, Black, Indigenous, 
Asian Latinx artists in our city, trans artists. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here too. Should I invite somebody to speak on your should? Yeah, um, how about we can just pass it to someone? I want this to be like a discussion also. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, Samuel because, you know, it's a nice hoodie. It's clean, it's crisp. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Samuel Getacho. I am 18 years old, um, born and raised in Oakland, currently living in Brooklyn, New York, um, as of the last month and a half or so. Um, and I am a poet. I served as the 2019 Oakland Youth Poet Laureate. Um, I've been writing and performing poetry, writing it privately for as long as I can remember, performing it um, since about 2017. Um, I am currently um, a Just Media Uprising Fellow, um, which is uh, an abolition journalism fellowship. Um, and I um, recently put out a piece about the uh, elimination of the Oakland School Police um, through that, which is something that I'm pretty proud of. Um, and so right now, um, my writing has been partially poetry, partially uh, journalism, specifically relating to, to abolition. Um, I guess I, I see Tongo with a very vibrant background, so I'm going to pass it to him. <laughs> the, the background, the background gave me up. <laughs> Right on. Um, hey, my name is Tongo. Uh, Tongo is a Martin uh, poet, you know, movement person. Um, yeah, it's just good to be with you all. <laughs> in, in money. I'm not. I'm not on the panel, but I can introduce myself. Um, hi, uh, I'm Imani. I. Um, Yep, living in Oakland. I'm a poet, I'm a writer, I'm a performer. Um, yeah, I, I have poems in, in places that you can read and other places that you can watch, which are both really exciting. Um, I'm a teaching artist. Um, I'm working right now with um, SF Jazz and performing arts workshop mostly. Um, but yeah, I'm all over middle and high schools right now, virtually, of course um in the bay area and yeah i think that's I think that's all i have to say about about who i am i can pass it to lob uh i don't know who's, who's... you're actually the last person to introduce oh. yourself <laughs> but um yes thank you guys all for introducing yourselves i'm so excited for the conversation we're about to have um, so yeah, so the first question that I wanted to ask is, well, this is sort of a mashup of questions, but have you been an activist or a writer longer? And with that in mind, is there a relationship between your activism and writing? And if so, please describe it. Um, and feel free to jump in at any time. I can go uh, first, I guess. Um... I think this is also, it's, I think it'll also be better for me to go first because my answer is a little bit of a cop out, but I don't really consider myself an activist. Um, and that's something that I consciously kind of stopped doing, um, I would say around 2018, 2019. Um, and I really, really became firm about not introducing myself or calling myself or labeling myself as an activist in, in the past year, because I think I've become very, very disillusioned with the label um i think at this point especially after the protests of last summer and with this idea of social justice and and anti-racism kind of entering the mainstream as this weird combination of both people with genuine intentions and then also social media trends that are inherently kind of shallow i feel like we've played out the word to the point where it doesn't mean anything anymore um and i think you know anybody can call themselves an activist, anybody can call practically anything that they're doing activism because there's no set definition anymore for what that means. And I think that um, for me, my work as an artist, my work as a writer, my work as a journalist, all of those things are much more tangible to me. And I think I, I approach all of them with, I think, the same intention that a lot of people 
maybe can you know would think of when you think of activism but for me i think it's much more meaningful to tie that meaning to, to my tangible work rather than than worrying you know does this qualify as activism am i an activist is this activist enough of me to be doing like for me it means much more to you know use what i think is my my best uh con like my, my my biggest ability to contribute um to the movements that i believe in which is through my writing i think that that focusing on that has has kind of made me more accountable um to myself and also to my principles uh, i could jump in um I appreciate that, Samuel. <laughs> um, I I think the term activist is a term that I think a lot of people have put on me more than I embody. You know, I, I consider myself an art, a poet, and a, and a cultural organizer. So that's just like it's a way of saying, you know. But my I'll say that to say I'm an, I I do consider myself an organizer, which means I I organize groups of people around a, a particular cause and an issue. And usually it's something that has to do with the liberation of people, the liberation of language, the liberation, the unlearning of a lot of things. And so um, I don't mind it. I think when I was younger, I, I kind of probably really hated it. I either really hated it or really loved it. I was like, you know, everything. Um, and part of me is still that. Um, I just think it's about intention. Like uh, for me as a poet, it's really easy to wow people on the stage and through my poetry and presence. You know what I mean? I think the tricky part is living your story, is living your poetry. So if you're up there talking about, for me, I'm gonna talk to about myself. If I'm up there talking about loving my sisters and brothers and my family and my sibling, I should I should be able to do that in my own home with my son. I should be able to do that with people in my neighborhood, in my community, you know, li really embody um, the poetic story that I'm trying to spread. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the most powerful use of activism to me is wherever there's love in it. Yeah, that, 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 that is a, di a difficult, um kind of orientation of autobiography to figure out um in, in in a way i mean we're all part of a you know we're, we're we're all laborers in a political agenda one way or the other um i was lucky to um kind of be second generation a second generation of it and was kind of raised around movement similar to how some people are raised in church and things like that. Um, but if I, to um, for the sake of definition, um, I would say that uh, that that I, I it, it would be a while before I could really call myself um, a, a revolutionary, and that it was a while it would it was a while before I decided to look outside of systems for social transformation. So while I've had, you know, movement principles and revolutionary principles and revolutionary practices, um, almost um, from day one, I was still technically teaching inside a system, right? And not lending my efforts to to you know, to the creation of actual people structure that stands in you know in true contradiction to the system, or shows or or, or deals with the reality that what's good for a ruling class is always terrible for us. <laughs> so uh, it would be a while before I, I, I would I would take the gloves off. But uh, what's interesting is that pro probably also. Um, I was a, a late bloomer in poetry as well, though I always had a kind of a knack. It was it'd be a long, long time before I'd kind of self-identify as a poet. See, in a way, I, I say all this to wrap up and say they actually cooperated as far as these two kind of identities, for lack of a better word, moving to the center of my understanding of myself. They actually kind of tag teamed me or tag team my psyche 
into this, uh, in, in, into what, what I hope is a solid revolutionary practice now or practice. Uh, thank you guys for sharing. And I can sort of totally relate as someone who was younger and started, you know, performing, doing stuff younger, sort of that title was just, you know, thrown on to me, like, here, I'm gonna make your bio, this is this. And as I'm getting older, I'm still, you know, learning the differences and learning, you know, what I truly want to be and who I am. Um, yeah, so we actually have a performance by Tongo, which I'm so excited for. Um, I'm gonna let him, you know, introduce his piece and everything, but yeah. Thank you very much. And, and again, let me emphasize how uh, happy I am to be with you all. Uh, this poem is called Blood in My Eye. Um, guided by teeth goes this country. Uh, there is a cow's mouth on the flag, um, uh, 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 a peculiar notepad holds street life dear, but the writer is is not here. He's somewhere talking to tombstones about the good old days of splashing, uh, reborn water on his latest face, so wondering how his old gun is doing in the afterlife, wondering how much death trap is in those gas station hours. It's got to be a million dollars a day on this concrete island. New engine in the moon, why it never goes down. I mean, 72 straight hours of night, at least according to everyone's posture around here. 8.30 in the morning is really 30 minutes of closing. The city shuts down for a sleepy rat race. Elevator shoe shuffle to the nearest heaven, laughing with rats the whole way up. There's scabs everywhere in puddles of city and concentrated schools and TV live warm rooms. You know, the light reveals military fatigue when it hits just right on the ties that are wrapped around the necks of lazy white guys. Empire is too easy, baby. Chant at the walls off some if you feel like it. Best way for a target to move is shooting back. Running for a tree line made of freeways. Wisdom says against a war machine on Tuesday, you stand no chance, but may we be the last poor people to play a safe cow's mouth on a flag. A politician raises his hand and the crowd shows their teeth. An oligarch raises his hand, little girl's not safe outside. You all high, depressed, and comrades and function. 15 minutes of closing in the city and survived another rebellion. We just paying dues by trash fires, not just anybody can set. And don't you love how deadly things whisper in a moment and people kill like feathers fall with everybody screaming inside? The writer knows that death is not a matter of dignity, rather humor in a house that smells like roach races, nuclear percentages on torn stalls. I mean, here life never was, just lazy matches and manic inhumanity, hands rushing away from life towards stalls. What we doing here? Surviving for no reason in particular, because nobody gone far today, nobody go far tomorrow. Trust me, hell and heaven cannot count. Strange gardens where secondhand clothes play and concrete wishes to be human so that it could be accountable. Where they find you drenched and drains wish to be human so that they could be worthy arms for you to die in. Hey, greet them all, grandson. Prepare for the day when every child is calm and don't say we ghosts didn't write you a poem. Don't say we didn't dig your life. Remember the shotgun by the coat rack that everybody in the house knows how to use. Remember the tightrope made of needles for walking in between driveways and man-made best friends. Go ahead, grandson, tune the street again. Never mind this country kills musicians first. Broken neck night, scar neck life. If these walls could write lyrics, they say, what's your angle, angel eyes? 30 to 50 rounds pass by on the street with no daughters. This street has no sons. It's young prisoners of war in a racist city that means to make capital. And we know so much. We know it all. We were stood against walls. Who's on the third cross around here? Cow's mouth salivating over the street. And that is the story of why we aim at teeth. Um, I know we're not in person, but if we could just all take a minute and just show some love and appreciation by that powerful piece by Tongo. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so yeah, again, thank you so much for that powerful piece. Um, so with that, you know, being said, I want to move on to the next question. Um, what have been your previous themes of writing and how have you approached them as an activist, an organizer or a writer, or you know, whatever you are and identify as? And feel free to just jump in at any time. Yes, of course. Um, 
what have been your previous themes of writing, of your writing, and how have you approached them as an activist or a writer, a poet, an organizer, really anything you identify as? Oh, I'll, I'll, mine is really simple. It's just love. <laughs> and as a woman and as a woman of color, I used to really be shy about naming that, you know, I always, uh, I always wanted to be cool with my dad and all the boys, you know, I was just like, not the, I was like a, not the girly girl. I wanted to be down with the boys. And so, and the same is true with a lot of my, actually my, my literary mentors or a lot of them are men, men of color, uh, cis men of color. And so there was a, a certain vibrato that they wanted me to have and a certain topic that, you know, thematically a lot of uh, the influences in my life, we're talking, my initial influences were men and beautiful men. We're talking about war and about power and about betrayal and about justice, uh, but in these really kind of large strokes. Um, and that to me, I've, I've grown into that voice. Um, but when I am just writing, um, everything has always been about love, whether it's me finding really myself in my mother's perspective and her shoes um, and finding forgiveness in, you know, at the fist of my father or whether it's finding uh, mercy in these systems of power and oppression that continue uh, to imprison, uh, that continue to profit off of the miseducation of young girls that look like me and you um at the very core is just small stories of love every piece of poem i've ever produced has been a testament to how much i love people how much i love forgiveness and mercy in real life and um how much i believe in something that i don't i've never seen like a world of of real justice that I've never seen, but I know is possible. And so I'm basically writing the same old story again and again and again. That's basic. I probably just discredited myself as a poet. Um, so never buy a book if I ever publish it because it's all just going to be the same poem again and again. But that's the long way of saying it's really all comes down to a what King would call a redeeming love. Um, I guess I can go. I think for me, I never like when people ask me like why I write, I always struggle to answer that because I've always kind of felt like I didn't have a choice. Like it was just the way that I process the world around me. And so thematically, like I look back on my poems like year to year, month to month, and it's a documentation of like where my head is at and 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 the things around me and the things that I'm struggling with and so you know you can and and this is partially why I've always felt like a little bit weird when people try to like categorize like okay this is a diaspora poem or this is a black poem or this is you know um or this is a youth poet like like when I get put into those boxes I always feel a little bit strange because you can't ever encompass the entirety of one person with one label and I feel like my poetry is a reflection of me and so it, it's always felt a little bit strange to have my work categorized if my work is a reflection of me that feels like I'm being categorized um and so in in that sense I think yeah that that's it's just been whatever has been on my mind or what has impacted me or what what's going on in the world around me. Um, and I think I always just try to approach my writing honestly. I think more than anything, I don't ever want to feel dishonest when I'm performing um, because I think if there's any area of my life where I have, I can pride myself on always having been fully honest and fully vulnerable. I think it would be in, in my writing and in my work. And so my only aim really ever has just been to be honest. And if I can continue to feel like I've kept that promise to myself, um, then I feel successful at that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I feel uh, uh, I feel similar to both. Uh, uh, both with Mush and, and Sam had to say, uh, I, 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 and I, I often just I, I feel kind of held hostage uh, by the you know themes uh, you know really just uh, you know whatever is um, whatever is gripping my psyche, whatever is gripping my consciousness, either as uh, phenomenon that I'm confronted with or even uh, that attempt to oppress me or a phenomenon that I'm inspired by. I think the groovy thing with writing though is that, you know, then the rabbit gets the gun because, you know, these things that grip me, now I hold them hostage uh, until this poem is over, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's, a, you know, that's, that's I, I think that speaks to the power um, of, of poetry and, and, and how, um, you know, it really is a, a power of co-creation uh, when, you, when you pick up the pen, co-creating the reality that both comes for you and, um, and, and, and cooperates with you. Thank you. And yeah, I feel like most of my writing, um, has lately most of my writing has been like to help other people write and so I really haven't been like writing for myself lately and you know when I'm writing for other people they're mostly a group of organizers and activists so they have one thing in mind you know a call to action to achieve justice so lately a lot of my writing has been like around you know well we need to do this to get this and I want this to look like this and just stuff like that but um when I was younger a lot of my writing was just about um my surroundings and how I understand them and really attempt to try to understand them. And that's the thing I like about poetry, it's an attempt to you know, try to understand and explain the unexplainable. Um, okay, um, so yeah, so this is probably a little tough question because I know it's a tough question for me as an artist, but um, you know, what is the goal of your writing? Who do you want, who do you write for and what do you want from it? Um, yeah, so just take a minute to probably understand that, but uh, yeah. I, I don't want to break the cycle, <laughs> but but uh, I I can I can go real quick. Just it, it with me, it it really is just experiment after experiment after experiment. I'm just really trying to just push, um, you know, just my powers of critical thinking. Um, and just see what extra little insight I can get out of a given slice of reality um, and see what kind of little, small little inventions I can come up with as far as, you know, different architectures of language, you know, different patterns of logic, um, different musical symmetries to it, you know? But it's all it's it, it's 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 I'm just experimenting and and using and, and using poetry really as a self education tool as well to just you know as a, as a, almost as a way of uh, setting enough of my mind uh, to the side uh, to to carry on kind of like an educational conversation <laughs> with myself. <laughs> you know, but it, it's it's curi it's curiosity, man. It's curiosity that drives me. Um, I guess I can go next. Um, I. I've been living um, on my own for the first time in the past like six weeks or so. Um, I'm moving out for the remainder of my gap year before going to college. Um, and that's why I'm in, in Brooklyn now. Um, and it's really interesting because it came in a way 
that I really didn't expect. Like I really didn't expect this to be my um, kind of first experience of independence. Um, growing up though, that was something that I thought about a lot was when I would finally move out, when I would finally go out into the world on my own. And um, I just, I keep comparing it. Like that's like that's what's been blowing my mind lately is I keep comparing like where where I thought I would be and, and the way that I thought I would understand the world, you know, when I was younger thinking about when I would be 18 and living on my own for the first time. And now I'm actually living it. And what I, th what I think confounds me the most and what I've spent the most time grappling with is that I thought that by the time I reached this marker of what I thought was adulthood, because I think when I was younger, I thought of 18 as, as much more big and grown than it actually is. <laughs> but I thought, you know, that I would have an answer. I thought I would have an understanding. I thought things would be clear and easy and make sense. And I thought that I would get some kind of manual that every adult gets when they reach kind of this point in their lives. And, you know, uh, if it's not obvious, that's not really true. Um, I was not given the instructions that I was expecting. <laughs> and it's been a lesson to me. This is all a very long winded way of answering the question. I promise I will get there. But it's it's been a lesson to me that life really does not have meaning beyond what you give it. And I think that that's, that's a really difficult, you know, at least for me, it was a very difficult realization to come to because as humans, you know, all we do is seek meaning. And for me, now I'm realizing that all of the meaning around me was made up by people and that I have to be okay with the fact that any meaning in the way that I view the world has to be created by me as well. And so when I write, that is my way of searching for meaning. That is my way of trying to create meaning from the world around me, from the things that have happened to me, from the joy that I've experienced, from the pain that I've experienced. That is where I, I find my meaning. And I think, you know, at the core of it, I think all art is humans doing that. I think that, you know, everything we build is in search of meaning, is in search of, of something to give meaning to. And so for me, if I walk away from a poem or from anything else that I've written and I feel like I've found meaning in some aspect of my life, then I think that that's the only goal that I can really hope to achieve. I love that. Um, and I, I can I concur. <laughs> everything Samuel just said, I second. Everything Tongo said, I second and third. I think, uh, you know, yeah, every all of that. I think we're trying as poets and as writers, we're always trying to, you know, use words to construct like the contours of understanding. It's like fancy way of saying or poetic way of saying like. I'm always just trying to understand something differently through the use of language, whether I'm listening to it or creating it. I'm, I'm trying to understand what does a different world and a just world look like? Let me, let me create it first here and here and here. Uh, and then what does that mean to me? What does it look? So I'm always trying to understand things deeper. So I think to, to Tango's point about inquiry, that's that to me is always the love and inquiry always, and a little bit of fight. Every poet has like a combination of those three things. We, we hate everything, we love everything, <laughs> and we wanna know about everything. Um, one of the most important things to me is just to feel in a culture, in this culture, but particularly also in Asian culture right now, there's a lot of talk about how Asian Americans, particularly in the in the midst of like this crazy surge of violence, it's you know it's not new. We know this, and in the midst of all of this anti-Asian violence, it's like a lot of our my people are are looking at ourselves and thinking, man, we ha there's a lot of cultural kind of taboo around feeling. There's a lot of cultural taboo around grief and about being scared and asking for help. The, you know, for me as a poet, if I feel, to Samuel's point, if I feel I did the right thing, 
More importantly, if I'm in a space, I'm also responsible for the room, for the collective kind of experience. So if someone says, hey, Mush, come talk, a, 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 do a poem about climate justice. For me, it's no longer sometimes, but mo more often than not, 90% of the time, it's not necessarily about being content specific for me. For me, it's about being spirit forward. It's like, can I create an unseen energy in the room that breaks us open to receive the content that Samuel's about to drop? that's the power of the culture that's the power of the poet and the cultural worker we're able to without using the head all the time break open and prime a community an audience a room you know a conference like this one to be prepared to understand on a level that the logical rational mind cannot and so sometimes it's just like did i get you to feel something you know at the end of the piece even if you don't get it, even if you look nothing like me, and have no idea what the heck I'm talking about. If there's a sense, is it there's an aesthetic of like, ooh, uh, then I think that's a that's a job well done for me personally. That's my kind of litmus test. I hope I hope I I wasn't too like all over the place. I'm very poetic with my responses. You know what I mean? Like, ooh, the spirit. No, I love that. <laughs> the spirit is good. <laughs> Yes, I love that. Um, they're all beautiful responses. I'm learning a lot already, but uh, yeah. Um, so, so far, this has been a really uh, rich discussion between these panelists, and I just want to take a little performance break and, you know, have Michelle, you know, read a piece for us. Um, I'm gonna let her introduce her piece, but um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks, everybody who's um, on the call. Thank you for being here on a Friday. Uh, thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, I know Imani, Imani's not on the panel, but Imani and I go back and I'm a big fan of Imani's work too. And so it's good to be in a room of, of writers. Uh, this piece is called um, From Oakland to Atlanta or When the Clay Pot Steams. Can you hear me okay? Dope. My America is a brick that dreams of becoming a waterfall. My America is a name heavy on the tongue. My America is mothers and rivers of milk. My America is heavy like the hyphen that bridges all that is human in heaven, self and other. Everybody thinks it's so easy to violate Asian women, possess Asian women, purchase Asian women, talk over Asian women, comfort inside Asian women. Shit, even some Asian women will stoop to stomping on each other to get to where they wanna get to because that's the material output of white supremacy capitalism and patriarchy in America is to maim, is to steal, is to outlanguage us of the skin that we're in. But understand this, I am an Asian woman and I was born loud. I'm an Asian woman and I was born with fight. I'm an Asian woman. I was born to slug. I'm an Asian woman. I was born to thug it out when there just wasn't enough. I'm an Asian woman. I was sent from the past. I'm an Asian woman. Yes, Asian women, we battle fast. I'm an Asian woman. We eat last. I'm an Asian woman and Asian women. We long to be soft or silent by choice without reason like the white girls get to. See, I'm an Asian woman and Asian women, we dream of one day putting down our guns. I'm an Asian woman and Asian women for once, we deserve to feast first when the rice is still hot, when the army stew is still rich in meat, when the rice wine is still cold and the clay pot still steams. I'm an Asian woman, I want to breathe. So let, let this be a blessing for women, for women who heal other women. Blessed be women and women and women and women because women have always been at the center of all things beautiful to me, Stacey Ann Chin. Blessed are angry women and rageful women. Blessed are thunder women and protest women. Blessed are women who have forgiven with mercy that pours like long, soft rain. Blessed are women who rage, but blessed who's Blessed are women whose rage has not been endured in vain. Let me tell you something about anger. The greatest myth about it is that it always goes to waste. But what is anger? 
if not a pearl of possibility in the calcified mouth of this hard ass world. And who's to say that women who rage don't also believe in a place beyond the city's pain. An angry woman per understands perhaps more than most how anger in its purest form is just a small story of sadness choking on a whispered prayer. So who better to lead a nation towards healing than she, the gold woman, the thunderclap woman, the black woman, the amber skinned woman, the forgotten woman, the poet woman, who better than she, the gold woman, the thunderclap woman, the black woman, the amber skinned woman, the forgotten woman, the poet woman, to teach us to choose love over lectures, sound over silence, and mercy over misery. Thank you so much for that powerful performance. If you could all just take a minute and show some love. Again, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I would like to move on to the next question. But um, how do you think music, poetry, really all types of creative writing has played a role in any justice movement? Feel free to jump in at any time, no order. I can I can start. Um, for me, it, it always goes back to um, this James Baldwin quote. And if you if you know me, if you see me on other panels, if you see me perform other places, you know that I love to wear this quote out. But um, <laughs> The poets, by which I mean all artists, are finally the only people who know the truth about us. And, you know, James Baldwin it said this in, in, in 1962. And I think that it has been relevant, you know, since then, since before that time. Um, I think it always will be. I think without art, without poetry social justice movements can't sustain themselves right like I, I i think art is such an inherently political tool that without it and and without artists you know and no no movement can succeed and and you know art being a political tool doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's always used for good right like if you if you research you know the roots of the FBI and and, and the CIA and then the U.S. government in um, the entertainment industry in Hollywood, um, you know whether or not the people are utilizing art for their movement work or not, the state always will. And so, for me, you know, I think that art and poetry it always has to be present. In, in any kind of movement work, because without it, you know, you lose the soul uh, and the purpose of what you're doing. Um, and so, so that 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 that's my my take on it. Sorry if you can hear the sounds of Brooklyn in the background. It's a little bit later at night here, um, but but yeah, that that I, I go back to that James Baldwin quote all the time um, because I think for me, sometimes it can feel a little bit frivolous, especially you know, when people are on the ground to be thinking about art, to be worried about writing and to be worried about my poems. But what I have to remind myself is that as much as, you know, being on the front lines is important, that can't be the entirety of a movement. Um, and that art is just as important to sustain it. Um. I think I'll try to keep it short. Um, I I agree. I think that it, to what Samuel said, I think the, you know, our poetry is the heart and the soul of the movement. I, I think culture precedes politics and or policy change, you know, so I feel like before policies are made, the culture 20, 30 years before, uh, you know, like before gay marriages were passed, um, it, that was a cultural movement that happened 20, 30 years ago. 
in order to get to that arrive to that policy moment. Same is true with like a, you know, Surgeon General warning on cigarette, you know, the label. That was a cultural move that happened. There was the whole campaign around tobacco and corporations and, you know, marketing to young black and brown children in poor neighborhoods. Like all of that was a cultural kind of intentional um, push. And, and so I feel like not only do we in the middle of a, of a social change movement, are we kind of the spirit uh, and maybe the, you know, the thread that keeps all of the different actions together. I also feel like we, we're, we're drivers in many ways of change um, that doesn't see policy shifts um, decades before, you know what I mean? And so um, we could probably draw a line from the civil rights, you know, the voting act all the way back to migration and blues and jazz music and, and kind of the spread of that. Like there are lots of ways to kind of uh, connect culture as the predecessor to big kind of mass change um, in systems. So in traditional systems like governance and all of that. Um, man, I'm a little concerned. <laughs> you know, I'm concerned with the, you know, I, I, it uh, today is, is such an like ideologically dangerous time in that we have a lot of this kind of the spirit of movement, the spirit of social evolution, uh, completely co-opted. Um, you know co-opted by reformism, which is really just more fascism. And, you know, ideology is very much kind of just rationalization or the ideas that rationalize some situation of power, usually backed up by violence. Um, and art makes that rationalization charismatic or makes that rationalization kind of, um, it, it tacks it emotionally down to your consciousness. And so when you listen in to people do anything, whether it's their writing or, you know, whatever they're outputting, there's always th that subtitle running under it, which is either this is why I'm a revolutionary, or this is why I'm not a revolutionary. This is pretty much playing underneath everybody, <laughs> what everybody has to say. <laughs> pretty much at all moments of conversation or monologue, you know. Um, I think though where, you know, so then what do we, we can do two, two things, or we can do one thing for sure, and then there is a potential. Um, you know, so we can make sure that we're a revolutionary 24 seven, or at least dancing with, you know, with the correct analysis, um, and then allow that to move our, um, you know, or, ju or just sit back and watch your art follow that. Um, but two, if you, you know, if you wanna, you know, if, if you wanna ex exert yourself, <laughs> Um, you know, what I think what, what an artist can do is kind of demonstrate a liberated mind in a very, very powerful way. Uh, rest in peace to Mums the Schemer who just passed away. Uh, on principle, rest in peace to him. But also, uh, you know, while I bring him into this conversation, he was the first cat I really saw just vibrating before me. And, you know, so like, of all the things I saw, or of all the the words I saw facilitated in 1998, you know what I mean? His is 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 um is um influenced me, or I will never forget. But more than the specific words, I remember just his almost his internal position or his his just just the power he was, you know, he was channeling. And so we're, you know, an artist has that kind of shot uh, 
to really demonstrate really the power of a liberated consciousness, the power of a free mind, or at least the power of a mind that is seeking liberation or in the process, in that, in that process. But I would uh, just implore everybody tonight, now is the time to be as, um, as uh, gently intentional, but intentional, you know, don't go, you know, don't go getting all heavy handed with yourself, <laughs> but intense, intentional, you know, because, 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 because the regular scheduled kind of wiring in our heads is very much tied to, you know, ruling class supremacy, you know, and, and so the more we deconstruct, uh, the more we pay attention, um, you know, the, the, then, then you actually, we have a shot of actually realizing this potential of a revolutionary artist to be uh, a beautiful, um, a, a beautiful organism of revolution. Um, thank you all for those beautiful and well said responses. Um, yeah, so this is the last question today, but um, why is writing so powerful and why is it necessary in really any movement seeking to achieve justice? I might take this first just because I, I do have to leave a little early. I apologize in advance. Um, I mean, people need pamphlets. <laughs> like people need a one sheet like where are we gonna meet people need language on the very kind of practical sense uh people need writers and people need writers that compel that provoke you know and that inspire or even just yeah just provoke you don't even have to get down with the language it's just like what what is that so I think uh, on that sense, the poet can do much more than uh, than what is expected or has been prescribed for us on the stage and behind a mic. Um, but beyond that, I, I feel like, uh, you know, there's so many brilliant answers that I, we can all share. I, I think one of the most powerful things is when we affiliate or when we're connected or tied to a movement or a vision for change, a lot of times when it comes down to it, when it comes down to, okay, how do we operationalize this? Or what does it even look like beyond the broad strokes? I feel like the poet is the one to start pulling on levers, is to start building the body. You know, I think somebody early, I don't know if it was Samuel or Tongo, somebody was saying something about architecting new world and new understanding. And I feel like that's exactly what the writer and the poet's job is, is we write a world that we haven't seen. Um, and we help people imagine and believe in that world because there's a lot of fear. Change is so, so, so scary, you know? Um, just think about like me, I just think about changing like my nail shop person. <laughs> I'm like, no, I gotta go to my person. And then think about it on a broad scale. You know what I mean? Like, how do we change the ways that we understand and love each other? How do we actually slow down and take time so that everybody in the room has access to understanding um, as much as they possibly can? That takes a totally different way of doing everything that we know. Um, and I feel like uh, the poet can really 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 paint that out beautifully um so but yeah i'll keep it there and and thank you everybody i'm so sorry but thank you oh, I, is this going to be recorded because i really do need to see samuel read at some point if that's the that's the goal i hope yes okay great thank y'all thank you so much for being here we all appreciate you and your beautiful responses Um, I'm just going to re-say the question for the remaining panelists, but um, why is writing so powerful and why is it necessary in really any movement seeking to achieve justice? 
Man, come on, man. Say something so I can just agree, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I think to, to Mush's point, um, from a practical standpoint, you also need to be able to articulate demands, right? Uh, you need to be able to, you know, write out a framework for the world that you want to achieve. And I think to my earlier point about feeling like we've played out the meaning of the word activist to the point where it doesn't really have one anymore. Um, I think part of my problem, right, with a lot of kind of contemporary superficial activism is that it doesn't really have a demand, right? Like, like even, even the phrase Black Lives Matter, even corporate kind of, you know, shows of support or solidarity with Black Lives Matter. It's like, what does that support mean? What are you actually doing? We need writers to articulate that. And then on the flip side, what are we demanding from these people who are declaring, you know, support, solidarity? What, what are our demands? What, what, what do we want from them? When you have people that, you know, go out in the streets and, and, and protest physically in the way that we imagine when we think of a protest, if there are no demands, if there's no goal attached to that, if there's no language besides kind of chants of Black Lives Matter, well, mattering is the bare minimum, what next, right? Like, what, what do we want? And I think without writing, without somebody there to articulate that, you kind of fall into this trap of everything just being symbolic and powerful because of what it quote unquote symbolizes, right? Um, and that doesn't actually change um, anything. It doesn't change anyone's material conditions. It doesn't you know, change the conditions that we're fighting against. And so I think in, in a more practical sense, <laughs> I think some of the, the most effective writing of past movements you know, has been that real gritty, not necessarily always poetic, but just very clearly articulated demands. Um, if you look at, you know, so many different, different works, if you look at the 10 point plan from the Black Panther Party, you look at, you know, even even on a local scale, right, like, over the past year, um, the Black Organizing Project in Oakland was successful in abolishing, you know, the Oakland School Police, but they were able to do that because over the course of years and years and years, they had written proposals, outlined demands, made, you know, their intentions clear. And I think that's the kind of nitty gritty, not so, not so glamorous part of, you know, protest and movement work. Um, I think that that falls on writers eventually in, in one way or another. I agree. <laughs> now I will add one little, one little thing um, that is literally lifted from, uh, or I encourage everybody to read Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and get it better, and get it better than I'm about to say. But uh, you know, one uh, one way, uh, one way, one of the ways that Freire uh, uh, basically um, defines uh, oppression is the stripping away of the power to name the world. So as long as other people are naming what's going on for you, naming you, uh, defining you, defining the world, then that your powerlessness uh, is ensured. Um, and so the reabsorption of that power to to define reality is the foundation for your power to then for uh, determine reality. And so that's a, you know, that's a, a kind of like um, almost a weird macro psychological uh, <laughs> thing <laughs> to keep in mind, right? We want our power to name things and, and, and what better way through the development of our of ourselves as writers. Thank you um, for those beautiful responses again.
Um, so yeah, so that was the last question for today's panel. And I just want to close this out with three performances, um, which I'm so excited to hear. Um, so the first performer will be Darius. Um, I'm gonna let him introduce himself a little bit and also his piece, but yeah, thanks. Word, word. What's going on y'all? Um, I'm gonna, gonna do the words. Uh, my name is Darius. I, I don't, yep, I don't have an intro. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about all the, the, the things the panelists are saying, so I'm a little thrown. Uh, I live just east of a contradiction. Clumps of human hair skip softly over sidewalk cracks. Tire tracks from sideshows carve murals into intersections. Midnight trimmers shake zip codes loose from the hands of their natives. Colonialism don't respect its own rules. All's fair in genocide, except self-defense. There are humans too familiar with squalor, or squalor right next to wallets that could solve the contradiction. Empty baby bottles roll under the freeway. Brand new cop cars patrol decade-old encampments. Dead grass grapples with the distance between beating hearts and piles of repurposed furniture and bench warrants drift toward gutters. Climate crisis confused about how many people we let pile up outdoors while profits skyrocket for empty housing units while a high rise crawls out the chapped lips of an investor. I'm not really sure how leasing works. I got my degree in human decency. I'm not really up on the latest ethics for ownership. All my comrades keep space on the couch and a spare blanket push the weight limits of a Honda Civic and there's always room. Always is a good excuse to shoplift under capitalism. Every day is sufficient evidence to start fires in the belly of empire. I'm not sure what's legal and what's tradition anymore. At some point, sick of this shit should lead us to get rid of city council, lest we be made of plastic promises too. I blame the suffering last for how they survived the winter. I blame the president for rainy days in the summer. I blame poverty on the police budget. I blame international military occupations on police. I blame police for all the times my father bit his tongue on the job. I blame police for my lazy eye twitch and my obsessive desire to produce. I blame the sheriff's office last week when I stubbed my toe and it left a metallic star-shaped blood stain in my sock. Thank you. If we could all just show some love, virtual love to Darius for that amazing piece. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, yes, thank you so much. Still a little stuck on that as the moderator. Um, so the next performer is Imani. I'm going to let her introduce herself a little bit and also the piece she's reading. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Imani. Um, I do poems and say them to people sometimes. Um, yeah, also grateful to be here and um, yeah, listening and, and taking in the things. Um, my poem, I went to San Francisco State, uh, graduated um, a while back and uh, got my degree in Black Studies and um, so much of who I am and, and what I believe in and um, how I move. Uh, as a as a woman, as a black woman, as a person, um, comes from my time my time there, and uh, because of the black people that taught me in that program, and so this poem is is for them. <clears throat> it's called uh, SFSU Fall Two Thousand Eight. Black women bear the sweetest fruit, and still. Dr. Head been mean since mean been mean, but us black folk don't get to grow old without hardening into a callus. And every hand in my family is black as soil, so I get it. But couldn't nobody say she ain't know the land. And I didn't even know black psychology was something to know. So there I was, first day of undergrad with my first black teacher since my mama when Dr. Head tells us to always, always, 
always capitalize the B in black, says be specific, says ain't a more proper noun, says we never meant black like the color, we meant black like loud, proud, like hair of brown, of bronze, skin of wool, got the nerve to die and come back black, like a church pew of first ladies on Resurrection Sunday. And they say black magic, the devil's doing, but black magic spun the earth like an old record. And I swear you can hear the stars hum when the sky's black is just the right pitch. And you can make some black beans stretch across a family, but a bowl of black beans will feed a famine till it overflows, then send it home with a to-go plate. Not black like a funeral, black like a coffin dance atop your favorite auntie while a grieving trumpet holds your good shoes black like one Sunday at Grand Annie's house pot had called kettle black and kettle was like you right and child they laughed a capital B laugh because they know black is everyone's favorite metal to mine and they've been digging in our business since before jet beauty's been black but you could find a drill long as the Mississippi and you still ain't gonna get you no oil that's black as niggas from any MLK Boulevard because we ain't mean black like the color we meant black like the meanest woman black like the sweetest fruit Yes, I love that. Thank you so much for that beautiful, amazing, wonderful, everything that means amazing piece. Um, yes, so I'm going to pass it to Samuel, who will be closing us out for tonight. But before I do, I just want to thank everyone for being here and all the panelists and performers for being here and sharing your thoughts and wisdom with us today. Yeah, so I'm going to give it to Samuel. It's a lot of pressure to close out, especially after two of Two poets who inspire me a lot, um, both Imani and Darius. I think, I think you both know, but um, a lot of pressure. All right, um, I, I have Anaya. Would it be okay if I did two pieces? Because my both of them are extremely short. Like first one would be like one minute. All right. Yeah, you're good. Um, I'm gonna do a new poem and then a classic. I think that's a good balance. Um, I'm gonna start off with the new one. When I turn 11, my uncle says it is past time for me to learn how to butcher a goat. Standing in their front yard in Addis Ababa, he arms my tiny hands with two curved knives, brings his cleaver down from the heavens and cracks open the goat's neck. I, standing in pooling red, make the incisions where he tells me to. Dissociate from my body, do what it takes to be considered a man in this house and later when we eat. He points out every organ on the plate. Reminds me of every limb I sliced. I do not know how to cook any Ethiopian food. The men in our families have barred themselves from the kitchen. We are only taught how to cut and kill, never how to create. Only taught how to spill the blood and never forced to clean it. All right, that was my, my first poem. Um, and I'm gonna do my second one for you guys. Don't know where it went. Um, and the second poem is called On Joe Biden and the Exceptional Negro. Um, I wrote it, I think around, we're coming up on, on that time. Um, I wrote it like last spring. Um, and that was before Joe Biden was elected. And I think since all he's been doing since being elected is making those little fan cams of him walking around, um, he been kind of on my nerves lately, so I'm bringing this poem back. We've got to recognize that that kid wearing a hoodie may very well be the next poet laureate and not a gangbanger. Joe Biden on the issue of racial profiling and mass incarceration, June 2019. After I receive word that I'm a finalist for National Youth Poet Laureate, I exhale in relief. At last, the chance to have my worth validated, my life quantified. Ever since I was a child, I've been told I'm exceptional. I'm not like the others. I'm thrilling how different. I'm, I'm, I'm different how thrilling to be raised on the myth of individuality. How misleading, how egomaniacally delightful to know that when the floodwaters come, you will be saved. 
to walk amongst the sea of regular Negroes, gangbangers, hood niggas, thugs, super predators, deadbeat baby daddies, a god amongst men, a man amongst boys, a boy amongst slaves, how blessed am I to have an opportunity to prove once and for all that I deserve freedom. Prove that my wrists are too delicate for bondage, my hands too inclined for the pen if I die. I know they will show my grade point average on the evening news. How blessed am I to have a resume worth mentioning in the headline? How blessed am I to be a viable candidate for martyrdom? How lucky am I to be able to write myself into a place on the porch, a seat under the table? How blessed to be graced with the possibility of scrounging scraps as they eat above me? How lucky, how lucky, how lucky. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you and I for having me tonight. Um, and, and thank you for everybody watching. Thank you so much for that beautiful piece and for closing us out. And I just want to thank everyone here one last time. I want to thank all the panelists and all the performers. You guys are so amazing. And I've learned a lot um, as a Black girl, as a poet, but also just as a human being living on this planet. Um, so yes, I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank um, Scores for, you know, inviting YVA here. I want to give a shout out to my hip hop and climate justice team for preparing these questions and really, you know, thinking and sitting down and getting to work and help me organizing the summit. I mean, not the summit, but the session. Um, yeah, so thank you all for being here. Thank you for the listeners for sitting here with us on a Friday night or I don't know where you guys are, but if you are in the West Coast Friday night um, sometime, but yeah. And yeah, so the next, the final session is at 9 a.m. on Monday. Um, Tango will be there. So, you know, go see him out, he's taking us home. But um, yeah, thank you guys all for being here. I was so excited, a lot of stress relieved, but yes, thank you.